Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to talk about something supported by the vast majority of Kentuckians. That's medical cannabis. Since day one of my administration, we focused on addressing the issues that Kentuckians face when they sit down at their kitchen table. Issues like having a good paying job, giving your kids a world class education, accessing affordable health care, and having the opportunity to live your life and prosper, to pursue the American, maybe even the Kentucky dream. We're doing everything we can to make sure that families across our great commonwealth have every opportunity to thrive. But far too many of our people face the obstacle of having chronic or terminal diseases like cancer. We have some of the highest rates of cancer in the nation. Many other Kentuckians suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, epilepsy, seizures, ALS, Parkinson's disease, and chronic pain. We're working on expanding access to health care for all of our families because basic health care is a human right. The highest quality health care is a human right. And when it comes to treatment, current options often include powerful, addictive opioids that are prescribed to manage pain. In 2021, we lost 2,250 Kentuckians to a drug overdose. Each one is a child of God. These are people we know, people we love, people we miss. They're missed by their families. They may be a brother, a sister, a mom, or a dad. Sometimes they're even our children. I have seen the devastation of opioids. That's why, as Attorney General, I filed more lawsuits against opioid manufacturers and distributors than any other state, much less any other Attorney General. It's also why I personally argued so many of those motions in court. They were just that important. And while I wasn't consulted on the settlements of many of those cases, I pray that the dollars that are secured will go to help every Kentuckian and every Kentucky community that has been impacted and been harmed by opioids. During my time as Attorney General, I also listened and learned that for many Kentuckians suffering from chronic medical conditions, there's another way to manage the pain without the threat of addiction. A recent study showed a 64% reduction in opioid use among chronic pain patients who used medical cannabis. Yet for years, including this last legislative session, Medical cannabis has failed to pass, even as nearly 90% of Kentuckians now favor it. And many have stepped forward to share their stories on how their quality of life has improved because of medical cannabis. Stories like a mom who was able to free herself from addiction to opioids. A lady who suffers from migraines, a type that can cause strokes, use cannabis to treat her symptoms after other prescriptions had failed. Mother of a veteran who approached me at a baseball game to talk about how her son had been through multiple deployments, three IED explosions, and the last one had caused post-traumatic stress disorder that only medical cannabis had ultimately provided relief. In a moment, you'll hear from some of those voices like Jared Bonville, a retired United States Air Force Master Sergeant, and Craig Manley, a small business owner of a construction company in McCracken County, who are telling their stories to us today. Also here is Linda McLean of Louisville's OBGYN and Addiction Specialist, who served on our Team Kentucky Medical Cannabis Advisory Council, a group of experts and advocates who traveled across the state to hear what Kentuckians had to say on this topic. A summary from the committee included these findings. Kentuckians of all ages are suffering from chronic conditions. Medical providers are prescribing opioids and painkillers that are not providing relief. And Kentuckians are fearful of falling into addiction. Kentuckians are leaving this state to access medical cannabis, some of them leaving this state for good to go to a place where medical cannabis is legal. They want to be able to return to the Commonwealth if they can without breaking the law. In fact, 
Kentucky's failure to pass medical cannabis has created an unfair and an untenable reality. I want to show you a map of at least 37 states that allow for medical and or recreational cannabis. Look at that. Now, I want to zoom in on Kentucky and our surrounding states. Here is our reality that you can purchase cannabis to treat a medical condition in Illinois. And you can use that medical cannabis in West Virginia. But while you're traveling through Kentucky, you're a criminal. That's not right for something that's legal in these other states and being used to treat such serious conditions. Finally, Kentucky military veterans on almost every one of these meetings explained the use of cannabis significantly easing PTSD. Attending the town halls, they emphasized the benefits. Some described the inability to sleep because of PTSD, while others reported being prescribed. You're going to hear about this multiple medications to ease pain, treat anxiety, sleep, or to move their joints fully. A veteran from northern Kentucky who served in both Iraq and Afghanistan described his daily struggle after being prescribed 13 medications that weren't effective, which left him contemplating suicide. Today we're joined by that veteran, Jared, who is here to tell us how medical cannabis has helped him. Jared, if you'd please join us. Thank you, Governor. You're very welcome. This opportunity is absolutely amazing, and I wanted to thank you for the steps that you're taking today to make my life and the other veterans in Northern Kentucky, in Kentucky uh, a little bit better. I was medically retired in uh, 2014, and at that time, I was about 230 pounds on 13 medications on a cane. I kind of thought I had about two years left to live, two, three years, based on how fast my health was declining. And a friend of mine, a new acquaintance, pulls me aside one day, I'm having a bad day, and he says, man, you need to smoke some weed. Now, I'm a former federal agent for the United States Air Force, okay? Deployments to Iraq, Afghanistan, it didn't make sense to me. One of my primary duties when I was with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations was uh, investigating all the suicides that occur. And the common thread there was no hope. They didn't have any hope. They had been the doctors, they had been on medications, but they decided to take a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. But that's what they believed. I believed it was bad at times. But then when I first started it, I started dropping medication after medication after medication. My mom looked at me and she said, you've got your soul back. My daughter got her father back. I got healthy. I saw a future. But then I was faced with, now you're a criminal. It didn't make sense. And what I've seen between then and now in these six short years is a change of life that is just absolutely astounding. I know veterans that have gotten off of heroin, meth, any drug you can think of, and have turned their lives around with the responsible use of medical cannabis. To me, it's a wonder drug. I don't even call it a drug, it's a plant. So, thank you, Governor, for making a difference. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Now, we should all thank Jared for his service and his sacrifice. He's an example that Sometimes we return with scars on the outside and the inside, and it should be our job to repay their service with providing what's necessary. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing here today. But next, we have a video message from Craig, our employer in McCracken County. At least I think we could. Uh, in Western Kentucky, 
It's called Manly Custom Contracting LLC. And uh, the reason that I'm here today is to talk about medical marijuana. In 2011, when we had the bad flood here, I cut my sciatic nerve in half and I was laid up for four months and there wasn't anything that was taking the pain away. A friend of mine came to me one day and said, here, this will help you, and gave me some pills to take. I was desperate and I tried them and they did ease the pain. They calmed it down to where I could rest and where I could heal. I found out later that that was THC. And it had no side effects and it did not do anything to me like what I had always heard that it would. The kind of work that we do here uh, is physical and it's demanding and it causes a lot of pain. And the thing that, the thing that I found out about it is medical marijuana is a way to ease that pain without messing with your body. It's, it's like it's a harmless painkiller. It eases you. Um, you take someone that works in what we do, if they get on prescription painkillers, they're dangerous to work around. So that leaves two other alternatives to pain. Uh, one is alcohol. The only thing is when you have a man that gets hurting real bad and he turns to alcohol at night to ease the pain, you've got the problem of him coming to work the next morning hungover. Now, if you have someone that goes home at night and he's hurting really bad and he takes a little bit of THC, it eases that pain. He sleeps good. He's well rested. He comes to work the next morning. He's ready to work. He's bright and he's alert. I am very conservative. Both sides want to help people. It has nothing to do with your views politically. Well, thank you to Craig for speaking up. It is clear that Kentuckians want medical cannabis. A total of 37 states, the District of Columbia, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands all allow cannabis for medical use by qualified individuals. In May of 2021, Alabama legalized medical cannabis. This year, Mississippi and Rhode Island did the same. Kentucky's neighboring states of Ohio, Illinois, Missouri, and West Virginia have legalized medical cannabis. Those are red states, those are blue states. It's not about red versus blue. It's about helping our people. So after hearing directly from Kentuckians over the summer, today I'm announcing two executive orders. First, I'm signing an executive order that will allow Kentuckians who meet specific criteria to possess and use small amounts of medical cannabis that is legally purchased in another state to treat specific health conditions beginning January 1, 2023. I want to be clear that there are several required conditions to qualify, and we can put them up. First, the cannabis must be lawfully purchased in the United States. In a state where the purchase is legal and regulated, you must keep your receipt. That's proof that you bought it at one of those places. Second, the amount a person can purchase and use at any one time must not exceed eight ounces. That is the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony under Kentucky law. Each person must also have a certification from a licensed health care provider that shows the individual has been diagnosed with at least one of 21 medical conditions, which include cancer, multiple sclerosis, post-traumatic stress disorder, muscular dystrophy, a terminal illness, and others. You must keep a copy of your certification. A complete list of those conditions is included in the executive order, which will be posted on our website and social channels. We're creating a palm card for law enforcement so they can easily determine with each of these conditions whether or not they are met, and we believe we've set it up in a very clear way to where any law enforcement official can very quickly identify if they have been. Today's action means that Kentuckians suffering from these chronic and terminal conditions will soon be able to get the help they need without living in fear of being charged with a misdemeanor. In the second executive order, I'm making, uh, I'm, I'm, making, I'm taking action to make sure the state is regulating the sale of Delta-8. So Delta-8 uh, contains THC, but at a lower level uh, than marijuana. It is not a controlled substance in Kentucky nor under federal law, and a Northern Kentucky court has ruled that it is legal in Kentucky 
and enjoined any law enforcement related to it. But right now, there are no checks on how it's packaged and or sold. So we must establish a regulatory structure to ensure that Delta-8 is sold, packaged, and purchased safely in the Commonwealth. The structure can and will serve as a template for when the General Assembly fully legalizes medical cannabis. It means we can train our ABC officers. It means we can have the right regulations in place. And it means we can accelerate any timeline in the future when the General Assembly does the right and necessary thing to fully legalize medical cannabis. These are actions that I can take as governor to provide access to medical cannabis and relief to those who need it to better enjoy their life without pain. But let me be clear, today's actions are not a substitute for much needed legislation. There are limitations on executive authority and we are seeing those here today. Because of those limitations and the need, I'm sure that there are some that will say our actions don't go far enough or maybe they go too far. What we're trying to do is take a measured step to help those that are struggling while ensuring they can purchase from a safe and reliable place and ultimately nobody should feel like a criminal when they can legally purchase it in one of our neighboring states and use it in another. So I'll be working and pushing law, I'll be working with and pushing lawmakers this upcoming session for full legalization once again. It passed the House the last several sessions. It's time that it passed both the House and the Senate. And if it's passed in a way that helps our people, we'd be able to rescind these executive orders because the legislation would take its place. Let me also add that the orders are flexible. I've met with leadership from both the Fraternal Order of Police and the Kentucky State Police, and I've pledged that we'll work with them to address any unforeseen consequences that can be done as simply as amending the executive order. But legalizing medical cannabis will not only further uh, support those suffering from chronic illnesses, it would also support our farmers, full legalization. It would create job growth, again, full legalization of medical cannabis. Our economy is ready for this new industry. We've already seen record-breaking economic growth and jobs being created over the last two years. We've seen the largest general fund surplus in our history, actually the two largest. Record low unemployment rate for the longest stretch in our history and for the first time in my lifetime, we've led the Commonwealth in job growth, not one, but two consecutive. We've led the country in job growth, not one, but two consecutive months. We've seen a lot of economic success, but that comes with the responsibility to help everybody in need. That's what we're doing here today. So before I sign these two executive orders, I want you to hear from Secretary of the Public Protection Cabinet, Ray Perry, the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet, Secretary Kerry Harvey, and Dr. McLean. Secretary Perry. Thank you, Governor. So I'll be very brief. Firstly, first off, I want to thank you, Governor, for asking me to be a part of the Medical Cannabis Advisory Committee. It's an honor to serve on this committee and it has allowed me to hear many impactful and personal stories of people suffering from various conditions. I want to thank all 3,500 people who participated in the online survey and who took the time to show up at one of our four town hall meetings. Each story was very touching and quite honestly, it was hard to hear. The desperation of people who are suffering when we know it's legal in 37 other states. It took bravery to overcome anxiety and often physical pain to stand at these town hall meetings. We saw it in their faces. But they did it because they wanted their stories heard, not only for themselves, but for their family, friends, and fellow Kentuckians. Today, I'm happy to say their stories made a difference. That's all I have to say. With that, I would like to introduce Justice Cabinet Secretary Kerry Harvey. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's good to be with you today. The governor's actions that he's announced today uses his executive power to help to provide real help to Kentuckians who suffer from debilitating chronic conditions. 
the governor's compassionate action moves Kentucky a step closer to the rest of America in terms of access to medical cannabis. In June, Governor Bashir named the Team Kentucky Medical Cannabis Advisory Committee that Secretary Perry and I were honored to co-chair. He did so when the legislature uh, failed to act on this issue in the most recent session. And he did so because thousands of Kentuckians suffer from chronic debilitating conditions that can be relieved by the appropriate use of medical cannabis, a treatment that's already available to the overwhelming majority of Americans, but not to Kentuckians. Our committee traveled the Commonwealth visiting with hundreds of Kentuckians who are keenly interested in this issue. These Kentuckians included veterans, physicians, business owners, parents, judges, teachers, prosecutors, Republicans, and Democrats. We found just as public polling has consistently demonstrated that Kentuckians support access to medical cannabis in overwhelming majorities. But the polls can't measure, the polls can't tell us how very personal this is for so many Kentuckians. The inability to legally access medical cannabis is hurting these folks. And these folks are our fellow Kentuckians. They're our friends and they're our neighbors. And this inability to access this beneficial substance is diminishing their quality of life. Today's action will help those people. During our travels, we heard from many Kentuckians who use medical cannabis for its beneficial effects. But they can do so only by violating existing Kentucky law. These Kentuckians leave the Commonwealth to legally obtain cannabis in one of the 37 states where it's already legal. But until today, they risk prosecution and conviction when they return to the Commonwealth for simply seeking medical treatment already available to most Americans. Others that we encountered reported that they've made the agonizing choice to forego this beneficial medical treatment out of fear that they would be violating the law. And what an awful choice that must be. The action taken today will help many of these Kentuckians, but as the governor indicated, only legislative action can bring us fully in step with the rest of the nation. One of our committee members is Dr. Linda McLean, an OBGYN and addiction specialist practicing in Louisville. And I think I should, it, before we go on, recognize all of the wonderful Kentuckians who served on our committee and who gave their time and their talents to this very important issue. Dr. McLean uh, has been on the front lines of this. She managed a medical cannabis clinic at one point in her career in a state where it's legal. And so I'd like to invite Dr. McLean to say a few words and share her firsthand experience with the group. Dr. McLean. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. It's a great day for Kentucky. As um, Secretary Harvey mentioned, I have um, managed a clinic in Georgia uh, in 2015. Uh, Georgia legalized medical marijuana and I opened the first and probably had the largest clinic in Georgia at that time. Over a two year span, I managed and treated over 400 patients with many, many different chronic conditions. I heard stories very similar to what we heard at our town hall meetings and saw these patients were desperate for help. When patients came to my clinic, this was their last resort. These patients weren't seeking to get high, they simply wanted to get relief. And even patients that can't take standard medications, narcotics with liver or renal disease are able to take cannabis very simply, easily. It's well tolerated. The psychoactive effects that, that we often hear about can be managed. It can be almost eliminated or diminished considerably when you combine it with CBD. So the therapies are there to treat patients and to help our, our fellow Kentuckians. One of the most important things that I think we can do with medical marijuana is as a physician, as a provider, 
offer this as a first choice, not as a last resort. Hopefully we can diminish the number of narcotic prescriptions that are written and have a positive impact on the opioid epidemic that I have seen over the last decade um, destroy our, our family and it's destroying our country. So I applaud the governor. I'm very excited about what we're doing today and it's just one step toward a, a full medical marijuana law. Right. Again, thank you. Stay up here. We're going to sign the thank executive you. orders. So uh, now we're going to sign both orders and then I will open it up to questions. So the first one I will sign will allow Kentuckians suffering from conditions like chronic pain and PTSD to possess and use small amounts of legally purchased cannabis beginning January 1. We want to make sure we get the education out on what's required to everybody and that gives us enough time. And then I'll sign the one on, on uh, Delta 8. Okay, we don't, I don't have a list, so we'll do this old school, and if you've got a question, I'll take it. Tom, well, this is normal. There you go. Tom Latek. <laughs> and I got another one here. Yes, you do. Um, what's, I, I guess maybe this is more a Secretary Harvey question. If, if, if. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, he was obviously top federal prosecutor for the eastern half of Kentucky, prosecuted drug crimes. Mm -hmm. What caused him to change his mind? So as you see here today, you actually heard from both the former attorney general, the top state prosecutor, as well as a former U.S. attorney. And we've had these conversations, looking at the devastation of opioids and realizing that there is a better option uh, has led both of us to where we are today. Um, Opioids are far too powerful for what they've been prescribed for for so long. And I will tell you, for me, I, I thought this was the right thing, but when that mother sat down next to me on the bleachers and talked to me about her son being through his third IED explosion, and this was the only thing that helped, it is the least that we can do. And we have to provide relief to those that have sacrificed uh, for us. But I think you'll find that while uh, some prosecutors may differ with what we've seen out there, with fentanyl, with everything that's there, um, that, that this is something that's uh, already legal in 37 states. Uh, it's coming everywhere in the United States. This is just a, a step that, that can provide relief uh, to some uh, of our folks uh, now as we wait for legislative action. Governor, how will this work with, like, if, for instance, there's a... Um um, a husband or a wife who, who needs it and the spouse goes out of town and gets it for them and they're stopped by the police. So there is a caregiver uh, allowance, but people need to be real careful uh, to make sure they're following each and all the conditions. Um, they are specific conditions so that we can tailor this in a way to where we have. Uh, we, we, we know that people are, are purchasing something that's been inspected, that's in somebody else's uh, regulatory uh, structure uh, that we are trying to create it strict enough to where there can't be diversion. In other words, somebody buys it and then later sells it. Um, so what I'd ask is that everybody look very carefully um, at the conditions in the full executive order and we're going to be putting up uh, some, some primers uh, to help people to, to get it done. 
but you need to prove that you are a caregiver if you are going to be the purchaser, right? If you are the purchaser and you don't have the medical condition, then you need to make sure you qualify uh, separately under it. If not, you need to travel together um, to get that done. Is there an age requirement on this? Like uh, the care, the caregiver uh, uh, hits that as well. Um, you know, there are um, children that suffer from horrendous seizures, uh, and so as we, uh, as you look at the executive order, a caregiver would still have to qualify. Um, and the caregiver themselves would have to be old enough to legally purchase uh, in another state, again, uh, with all the other conditions met. And can they give that then to a child? That, that, that would be allowed in this, provided they can meet all of the specific criteria, and that means that the child qualifies for a real, serious, chronic condition. And so again, I mean, I, I think it's drawn specific enough to hopefully we won't see uh, fear-mongering, but uh, that would mean a child has severe epilepsy. Have or, you seen those videos of these children? It's tough. Yes? Governor, uh, will there be um, practices in place to perhaps alter or change what medical conditions qualify under this plan? Uh, say things like generalized anxiety disorder, other mm -hmm. mental health issues that have shown some benefit in studies with medicinal cannabis use, um, other physical disposals, and how will that be approached? Who will so, be the oversight agency on that? So the fact that this is an executive order means it can be changed by the executive. Uh, so just like we'll be working with law enforcement in case there are unintended consequences, um, we can also work with the medical community on adding um, or if, if there is scientific evidence that disproves um, any piece. Uh, we can and want to be fluid on it, it'd have to be on a going forward basis though. So if you have a condition that is not included in the list uh, and you want to talk to our administration on it, we want to be open to that, but understand it needs to be added before it would be allowed. So again, we want to make sure, and that's what January 1st is giving us time to do, that those who want to or need to treat a specific condition know everything they're going to need to do and, and law enforcement and, and prosecutors and, and judges do as well. You said this is not a substitute for much needed legislation. Can you talk about what you'd like to see happen ultimately? Well, so this is not a substitute for much needed legislation, though I believe it's the biggest step towards medical marijuana that we have ever seen uh, in this state. Um, but we need um, legislation to allow for the um, cultivation and purchase and sale uh, right here in Kentucky. Uh, and what that will do is probably create a better uh, system where doctors and patients and, and the ultimate uh, uh, providers and retail uh, can all work together in a system regulated uh, by the Commonwealth to where people can get relief in their own community. Uh, without legislative action, we're also missing out on all the jobs, 37, 38 other states. Uh, have it, are able to um, uh, ultimately benefit economically from it, and in a time when water's drying up in so many other places, um, we are in a, a position uh, to create a lot of jobs out of it. Uh, but I also think that, that you know, legislation will give people um, even more comfort uh, in being able to, to uh, purchase what would then be a fully legal substance in Kentucky uh, to treat their condition. Governor, yep. are you concerned at all after the General Assembly trimmed back some of your powers with executive orders uh, during the pandemic? Would this also be subject to that? Uh, this executive order is based on the constitutional pardon power of a governor. It would take a constitutional amendment um, to uh, alter or change uh, that authority. What about like secondhand smoke and like people, like if you work for some companies if you have an accident? an employer places on their employees and so they need to talk to their employer if this is a step that they want to take to treat a condition and also be cognizant of, of potential um, you know secondhand smoke and whether you would actually test positive um, from that but but people need to be real thoughtful of that 
And again, legislation changes so much of that and, and can. Uh, and so we want to be very clear on, on um, how you go about doing this, but also everybody to be real thoughtful of whether or not it is the right decision with their condition and their situation. Uh, we want to be especially clear for January 1st uh, for people to know exactly how to go about it, what to keep, what type of proof to have, and even have that palm card for law enforcement. So no one can ever use this as an excuse if they're engaged in other activity that would not fall within medical uh, cannabis. Have you spoken, since he's been a sponsor of the, the bills that have cleared the House, have you spoken to Representative Jason Nemus uh, about this and perhaps uh, Senate leadership since that's kind of where it's uh, I've not had the uh, opportunity yet to discuss this with uh, Representative Nemus. Um, certainly it is within executive action and authority uh, to take the step. But listen, I hope he again files his bill. Uh, we were supportive of it. We pushed for changes. We got some. We didn't get others. Uh, I think that the steps we're taking with Delta 8 uh, will allow an accelerated timeline for any bill uh, that he puts up. He got it through the House. That's a good thing. Uh, now we need to get it through the Senate. And I think that those that support legislation should also support this because it's not about whether we can get it through this part or this part. It's about the people. It's about people that are suffering. And I hope we can provide them this form of relief if they qualify until legislation's passed. But I would anticipate legislation will provide relief to more individuals than the executive order. Now here, you, you still have to travel, you still have to meet um, uh, certain conditions. Uh, certainly those suffering that this could help having it more accessible after legislation, legalizing medical cannabis in Kentucky, that would be optimal. Senate leadership, as you were talking about, um, I just <laughs> talked to them today, um, they keep bringing up, we need more studies. We need to see the medical effects, and they're really medical benefits. Um, we need to see more studies and the polls that we're hearing about the vast majority of Kentuckians wanting them, they haven't seen those polls they claim that are the even accurate polls. Your reaction to that? <laughs> um, I'll take Jared's word. This is a veteran who served our country. This is somebody who's gotten off 13 medications. Uh, this is somebody who's not only speaking for himself, but so many other veterans. And we didn't just do this overnight. We traveled the entire state. We had uh, experts and, and, and others on a committee. We heard from people directly. We did all the things the General Assembly hasn't done uh, to go out and to secure that information, and we're happy to provide it for them. But as if 37, 38 other states have done this, there's plenty of information out there on it. There's a difference between a stalling tactic and truly needing more information. There's there's enough out there. So you don't believe more studies are needed? No. Governor, are Kentuckians even eligible to purchase medical marijuana in states where it's only medical marijuana or will they have to travel to states where it's full <clears throat> legal? Event? So it's uh, state by state, but there are states that allow for medical marijuana that you can make purchases if you are from another state. Uh, again, that's another thing that people need to look at, right? Where are you traveling and what are their rules and regulations? And we'll put those up too. Um, so I again want to emphasize that this is time to make a plan on how to do it and how to do it right. Now, um, you can purchase from a state that is recreational, but only, again, if it's legal there, if it's under eight ounces and you have the certification from a doctor about your condition. And so the purchase is allowed in, in both types of states, but you still have to meet all those same specifications. So eight ounces is the, the limit? Eight ounces is the difference between a felony and a misdemeanor in Kentucky, and so that's where we've set uh, the limit. You have another comment, Chief? Governor, one good thing about the VA system Come on. Is... You can talk at this podium many times, you want. Thanks, sir. One good thing about for veterans for the uh, medical cannabis that makes it a lot easier is if you've gone through the VA medical system and your disabilities are actually documented. Specifically in Ohio's medical system, you walk into the doctor, you print out your disability list, 
and it's signed off because it's already been identified by a medical professional that this um, issue that you have can be taken care of. When I had a Ohio medical card, my appointment lasted five minutes and he thanked me because all the documentation was already done. Could, could you step up to the podium a little bit more? And yes, sir. Could you talk a bit again about how this has changed or saved your life? Oh, absolutely. Before I started using cannabis and got Miss Recon here, I would maybe leave the house for two or three hours and then I'd probably not leave again for a couple of days. Um, I had four to five concussions throughout my tours and I got to a point where if there was a word that was over three syllables or over two syllables, I couldn't use it. So I go from having several college degrees and not, to not even be able to say a word. So that was one difficulty, but the, the, the suicidal portion of it, um, which to me, it didn't make any sense at all. There was a disconnect in my brain that made no sense. And the second I added medical cannabis to it, things got better. And it, it made no sense to me. But then when I started researching it, I realized, wow, this is amazing. The amount of research that currently exists is just astounding. And it's difficult to get it out because of the restrictions that our government puts on this. Most people are scared to discuss it in public. I mean, me, rightfully so, being a prior federal agent, this changes you. Now you realize that there's certain things out there that exist when used responsibly can do amazing work. I've seen it firsthand.